few things and then we can start right away with the content that you are actually here for in a second. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with this platform, which is Big Blue Button. It's an open source video conferencing tool. So just to give you a, a rough orientation, bottom parts, depending on your permissions, you will see different icons. Unmute yourself, turn on your camera if you want to. But I think most important for you might be the chat here. Top left corner, you can use the public chat to post your questions during the presentation. I will collect them and then ask the speakers at the end of each talk. We'll have 30 minutes talk each to React, Vue, and Angular. So if you have any questions, feel free to use the public chat. So a quick word about CH Open, which is the host of this presentation. So what is CH Open? It's an association in Switzerland to promote open source software and open standards. If you want to have more information about the association, feel free to scan this QR code or visit the website ch-open.ch. Now a few polls before we start with the presentation. So I will ask you a few questions and you can vote just to give us a bit of an understanding where you come from. The first question is, did you know CH Open? to vote and I will share the presentation and the results afterwards. 14, 15 votes out of 18. Okay, give it one more second, 16. Okay, so we see two thirds did not know CH Open. Okay, now you know. Next question, where you come from? mainly Europe, but also visitors from other places of the earth. That's great. Last question about your, oops, sorry. Last question about your JavaScript, HTML, and CSS skills. How do you consider your skills? Rather diverse from foundational to also very professional ones. So I think that's good for the speakers so they can also adjust their presentations more or less you know, if they can expect some questions. But it looks good. Okay, now last slide about the speakers. We have Stefan Rodev from IBM. He's lead UX engineer and AI designer. And he will present to you Vue.js. Then followed by Nick. He is also working at IBM developer advocate, and he will present React.js. Lastly, we have Noe. He's working at a software developer, as a software developer at the FDN University of Bern, and he will present Angular. So I think now it's time I will start with Stefan. If you're here, I will give you... Yes, perfect. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm Nick. I'm a developer advocate at IBM. Uh, I've been working here for about four years, and normally my job is to talk about IBM products um, around artificial intelligence, main, mainly uh, visual recognition. But a lot of what I do is build demos uh, that showcase this kind of stuff. So one of the projects that I work on is Cloud Annotations. Uh, and that is completely written in React. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start talking about React. Um, so React was created by Facebook about seven years ago. And it was designed to be uh, able to be gradually adopted. Um, so that means you can start with a, a simple HTML page. And, and add a little interactive React component to that easily. Or you can um, write your entire application from the ground up in React. 
Uh, and this is what a, a React component looks like in its simplest form. Um, we're, here we're creating a div element with the text hello world in it, and this is gonna be injected into the DOM. Um, but, but that syntax isn't too pretty to, to work with. They also provide and introduce a new syntax called JSX, which lets us write um, uh, XML sort of format that, that looks pretty familiar to HTML. So here we're, we're doing the exact same thing. We're, we're uh, creating this uh, div element with the text hello world. Uh, and, and for the rest of this, I'm gonna start uh, doing a live demo of uh, what I think are the most three most important parts of a React component: um, props, states, and effects. Uh, so I'm going to switch over to Code Sandbox, which um, with this with this JSS syntax, you have to introduce things like Babel to transform it into actual JavaScript. So it can be uh, a little tricky if you're a beginner to to set that up all by yourself. Um, so I find Cone's, uh, Code Sandbox is a useful tool that, that kind of uh, bootstraps all that for you. You don't have to deal with Babel or Webpack. Um, you can just start working with React right away. Um, there's also tools uh, like Create React App and Gatsby that also um, let you bootstrap a pod project that you don't have to be uh, stuck in this kind of internet ID. I'm gonna open up this index.html file. Um, this is just a standard regular HTML file. Um, and take note of this div right here, where it has an ID of root. Um, and this is where we're going to be injecting our React application. Um, and if we jump over to index.js, here we're, we're getting this root element and we're having React DOM render this app component into that root element. And this is what that uh, component looks like. Uh, React component is just a simple function that returns this uh, JSX of uh, where it's gonna be a, a div with a class name of app and hello world. And, and over here we have some styles for the app class. Um, with just a, a sans serif font and we're aligning everything into the center. So this, this is a pretty simple component. It's just rendering static text. Um, but one of the things with React is that we can kind of compose a bunch of components. So I'm gonna create another component called hello. And it's going to return uh, hello name, and I'm going to add name here. Oops, let me put this in a div. Okay, and then I'm going to replace this with our hello component. And I'm going to do name equals name. Uh, so now we have hello Nick being rendered here. And, and what this is doing is this is a prop, um, which is just short for properties. Um, so this is similar to like uh, our class name and, and, and similar to the, the stuff you might be familiar if you if you've worked with HTML before. Um, and whenever this this information is transformed into uh, an argument here that we're um, deconstructing, but it, it'll actually look like this. So we have this props argument and then we can also access it by doing props dot name. Um, but it's it's pretty common to, to see it uh, like this. So, and one of the important things about props are that you, you, you can't mutate them. Um, so we, there, there's not really a way to, to change 
uh, to mutate Nick to be something else right here. Um, and, and something we could try doing is let's make a, a variable named name and set it to be Nick. And we're going to oops, uh, pass the name variable as the property to name. Uh, and, and we have have name Nick is still is still here. And I'm going to add a button. And I'm going to have the text be change name. And I'm going to add on click. So whenever uh, the button is pressed, it's going to call this function that I'm passing it. And let's do name equals not Nick. So now we would hope if we click change name, it'll change my name to not Nick. Uh, but it doesn't do that uh, because React doesn't know that it needs to re-render the page because we're trying to just mutate this name variable right here. Um, so this is where state comes in. Uh, and React gives us a function called useState use state that returns an array with name, or it, it, it's just an array, but we're going to call the, the first variable name and the second variable in the array set name. And we're going to do use state, and we're going to pass it Nick. And what this means is we're setting the default state to be Nick. And the, the first part of the array is the actual state. And then the second part in the array is something we can use to update the state. Um, so we see here again, we have hello Nick. And uh, it's, it, it won't let us actually, uh, if we click this, it'll error out because name is read only. And what we need to do is change this to set name and we're going to pass set name not nick and this will update the state value to not nick and then it'll re-render the component so now if i click change name it updates to not nick cool so now we have props which are properties we can pass down to a component which is what we're doing here we're passing the state to hello as a property and we have state, which is a way for us to update state with or uh, update um, properties without actually updating, uh, mutating the property. Um, so, so we can change it through things like events or um, uh, subscriptions or data fetching and stuff like that. Um, so actually, let's let's try to do. We're gonna clear all this out and create a new component that deals with subscriptions. Um, so I'm going to change this to a timer. We're not going to pass any props to it. And let's do seconds, seconds. And we're going to have a state in this component called seconds. have a use state and its initial value will be zero and then we can get rid of this and now let's render our timer component so we have we have our timer with zero seconds so let's try to do a set interval and we are going to set seconds and um, the, the, the set seconds, the, the second part of the, the use state array, um, it also lets you pass a function to it. So we're going to pass a function um, which will give us the, the seconds value, the, the current state value inside of this function. So we can update increment the, the seconds by doing uh, s plus one instead of using the state 
to, to increment. And then let's do it every second. might need to redo this because the issue I was going to show crashed it. <laughs> We can still hear you. Maybe you can use the private uh, mode, Chrome. Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to create a another sandbox. Look what we had here. And now we should see this number is jumping like crazy. So I'm going to delete this before I freeze it up again. <laughs> um, so it's not actually increasing uh, one every second. And that's because every time we change this state value, this entire component gets rerun again. So we're creating an interval every time we update the seconds. So every second, we're creating a new interval that's updating the seconds. So it starts going crazy. Uh, and and that, this is where we introduce effects. Uh, and, and we want to put any sort of subscriptions, DOM changes, or data fetching into an effect. Um, and we can do that by another function that React gives us called use effect, where we can pass a function. Um, so I'm going to put our interv interval, oops, our uh, set interval in here again. This time, all right, so s equals plus one. And it's still jumping really fast. So I'm going to comment this real quick so we don't freeze it again. And, and the reason is use effect is still running every time this component remounts. But the thing with effect, with use effect, is that it also lets us return a function that allows us to actually clean up the subscription that we started. Um, so I'm going to do clear interval and interval ID, and then const interval ID. So now every time it runs this effect and then the component remounts, it'll clear the interval. So now we're actually increasing every second. But this is still running uh, every mount, which we might not want to do, which effect, use effect lets us pass another argument, which is a dependency array. And that makes it so that it only calls this function anytime a variable in this dependency array changes, which right now we're not actually using any variables outside of, of this effect, so we don't have to pass anything to um, this dependency array. So now it'll only set up this interval when the component first mounts, and then when the component unmounts, it'll clear the interval. So let's try something else. I'm going to create an effect that updates the title of the website. 
So let's do document dot title equals uh, seconds. Seconds. And you might see a lint warning. We'll, we'll get we'll get back to this. I'll open it up in a new page so we can actually see what's happening. We can actually see the title change. Uh, so it changed the title to seconds zero, but it, it's not actually changing it whenever uh, these seconds change. So let's go back over here. Uh, and, and, and that's because we we're using this seconds value, but it's not part of our dependency array. So it only runs when it's mounting. It doesn't run again whenever seconds actually changes. So now if we go back to this other page, we should see seconds in, uh, incrementing here and also in our title. And yeah, so that's that's basically what I think are the three most important of React are the props, which are the properties that we can pass to a component, um, which it renders, and the state, which is something we can change. So that things will re-render whenever state changes. And effects, which are uh, ways that we can uh, modify state um, through, through things like subscriptions, or if we were um, fetching data from an API, or anytime we want to do a DOM mutation, like setting the title. Yeah, thank you. Any questions? I don't see any questions in the chat so far, but uh, if there's anything else coming up later on, I will address it to you again, Nick. But thank you for the presentation, the live demo that takes some courage to also do so. <laughs> so I think, Stefan, we can try again. Yeah, how can you hear me? You? Now. Yes, yes, very nice and clear. Oh, so thanks, Nick. And if, way it should if, be. <laughs> Nick, if it's your lunchtime now, then you might just stick around for a bit longer unless there are any questions. Or Thank you for your contribution. So, Stefan, stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, right. Just so, last thing, how can I switch the slide to make me present there? This, I should make this small just. Oh, yeah, I see the button. Great. Okay, so hey, everyone. Super happy to be here. Uh, a bit sad not to be in Actorik because I really love the city, but it's also nice online. So let's talk about Vue.js for a while. Um, well, so this is how a component looks like to, to get right to the meat. Um, Vue.js, when it, when it started, make um, kind of a splash in the, in the front-end community by having uh, an interesting approach to components, which was basically a bit like market markup driven. You can see that it's almost like an HTML file and a very lean approach, very, very, very simple and also opinionated in the way you do the thing. So you see here, the component is very simple. You have a template at the top of the markup that you use. And uh, as you've seen in Nick's presentation, you have also the same concept here of uh, templating and replacing data in the markup. And below you have a small script that actually describe what you have from data. Additionally, you can also add all of kind of, of code or functions on that. We'll look at that later. And then finally you have the style at the bottom. And here scope means that it's only accessible to this single component. Um, yeah, but there are lots of possibilities on that. So, it feels a bit like a web component, right? And uh, this is not completely a coincidence. Uh, Vue has inspired itself from web components uh, from the start and, and taken, uh, let's say, the, the fitting bits out of that. Uh, so that's that's very interesting aspect, like you know the slots or the templates, or also uh, the scope stylings are all things that are heavily influenced by by the web components. So. Those component, the single component files, they are um, they are extendable. You can use different languages, 
and different type. For example, for the template, here this is an example with Jade instead of uh, HTML. Um, for the script, you can, for example, use things like TypeScript is, uh, is very popular. And for the style, you have all kinds of possibilities. So here you, show, you see stylus, but uh, you can use SAS, CSS, you can use um, also CSS module. So you have lots of uh, possibilities to make it your own. So let's get back to, to the basic first. Um, so first steps, um, a view is, um, is in, interestingly modular. So here we start with just some markup. And as you can see, the text that's in the, inside this markup is just rendering as it is for now in this app. So this is really the start what we have here. So what do we do? Um, basically somewhere on your page, uh, depending on the context and your preference, you might put this on the head or at the bottom of the page, but basically you include just a script tag in, in your page and then you include view. And so that gets you the basic functionality. And from there on, you can create a new view instance in a couple lines. You say that EL, so the element that it's targeting will be the app and you pass the data hello view as message variable. And what you will do, it will understand, okay, I'm taking ownership of the div um, that matches the, um, the app ID and uh, I, will, I will pass it and, and then replace the data. So additionally to that, um, I think this is, this is one of the main difference about with React and it's probably nearer to Angular in that, in, in that regard is that you have so-called directive. So the, the markup um, is enhanced with um, additional keywords that helps you uh, put, for example, here conditions based on Boolean. So the text that you see here will only be shown when seen is equal true. If it's equal false, then it will not be visible. And you have also loops, so you can go over your data and iterate over your data in, uh, in list tables or whatever kind of elements you want to put in your app. So always after the same principle. And then you can react to user input also with a directive by um, a V on. And here you, we react to the click event that we call the reverse message method, which is displayed as you see in a new data structure in, into the view. So we, all the methods are, are passed as um, in, in, in one common data structure. And so this is how you can react to user input. So, well, have you noticed something in there? Well, it doesn't look completely like the single file components that we looked at the start, right? So what's happening here? Well, there are actually multiple ways to use um, Vue.js and uh, that's where it starts to get very interesting. So you have the choice of using Vue just like you would use jQuery. Like you bring the Vue.js uh, script into, your, um, into, into a script a tag on your page. And with that, you can enable Vue on any element inside the page that you decide to. And so that means that it can work pretty easily with some, you know, any kind of legacy tooling that you have. I don't know, maybe a WordPress page or an existing website. And if you just want to enable one of the thing, like you want to have an interactive element or something like that, or you want to enhance the navigation, then you can just go and use that. Um, but the other approach that is very often used is to use the, the Webpack setup uh, that uses ViewLoader. And view loader is an addition to Webpack that um, allows it to understand this uh, single file component format that I showed before. So what is Webpack actually for those who don't know that well? Webpack is, um, this is actually a pretty marvelous tool. It's also at in some aspect complex. Like if you uh, really work on bigger projects and so on, I think uh, all of you who have worked with Webpack will have fun stories to, to tell about it. And this is very interesting. This is a so-called bundler. And what it does, it take all your code and, and put all your code in, in less files. In, it put it in files together. Why? Because if you have hundreds of requests in the browser for one application, then it will get very slow to load. And the browser has limited capability to um, 
to to download multiple resources in parallel and and also you know when you have the, the the scheme on the on the left here that means you have to download each one of those files one after the others um, and then see what their dependencies are so it's better to do it in the forefront and webpack does this in a very intelligent way it's able to understand uh, uh, what the file means how they work uh, what is a reference inside them and that way it builds a so-called dependency tree and out of this tree it builds single files of each type so that everything is really very optimized and um, I think many uh, backend developers do, do not um, uh, enjoy the like um, the complexity and the power that there is in tools like Webpack. This is really a, a major innovation in the web. And so there is also one of those Webpack um, uh, uh, plugins is able to understand uh, the view format and that way to package those view applications. So. That means that view loader really um, is, is a way uh, to, to integrate components into components and to build the full application. But now there is a new approach uh, that's very interesting and it's basing on ECMAScript modules. Um, so if you don't know too much about this and, and don't understand all that this means, uh, do not be worried. There are, um, the rest of the presentation is not depending on this. But I think this is a very important point and well, interesting point to know about. So VIT is, um, is a new tooling um, that has been also developed um, by Ivan Yu. And this is the link that allows us all complex configuration and have something much more linear, how it relies on ECMAScript modules natively. And so it just look at your file, take the dependencies one after the other and does everything dynamic of precompiling which is very easy when, when you work with developing, for example, you have a super fast feedback loop, right? You don't wait uh, two or three minutes until your whole uh, CSS compiles again, et cetera. So it's, it's pretty nice. I've not, I've not played really much with that one. I've been reading documentation, but I think this is definitely next on my list. So for getting started with a view project, usually what I would advise is um, to get started with view CLI because this is just a super powerful tool for managing projects. Um, it, has, it has a CLI, of course, as the name say, but uh, what the name doesn't say is that it's also a full UI. And so there is this project dashboard you can uh, navigate between your project at the top left, and you can manage uh, the project that you're currently uh, running. And then you have all kind of things that you can manage there. So for all the plugins, if you want to add the router, or the state management, which we'll look about uh, just later, it just enables it away and you can, you can build additional plugins. So it, it makes for, it, it makes the, 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 the task of managing uh, a view application in long term way easier. And I can tell you because I've started writing view applications before this tool uh, and uh, it was a lot of work uh, back in this. So you can also change uh, your compiler settings. You can enable things, CSS modules. So this, this is pretty nice. So what, if you have worked with Webpack, um, you might probably know that it's often pretty quick on to learn um, to a long configuration. And it's when you generate a project, you, you, you take a view you of, it's yes, it's sorry. You can turn off the camera because it's, it's again, a bit tr 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 tricky to hear you. So maybe okay. it's easier like that. But is it done now? Still stuttering a bit. Uh, I don't know what's happening, folks. I'm sorry. Switch the browser. We heard you perfectly well until you came with the view CLI. And then okay. Stuff. Let me leave the audio quickly and restart it. It takes one minute, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your patience, participants, as well. Okay. 
Can you hear me better now? So far it's good, yeah. Okay, good. Let's give it a try. Hopefully it will hold you until the end. Sorry for that, folks. Um, right, so Vue CLI is, is a really powerful tool for maintaining um, uh, projects in the long term and managing them. So if any one of you have worked with Webpack on um, a React or Vue project, you probably know that the configuration um, in um, production project pretty fast go, grows quickly. And anyway, if you start from a good boilerplate with the necessary tooling, it, from the start, it will be already pretty easy. I remember the, the initial Webpack configuration for a Vue project was already uh, a good dozens of files. And the problem with that is that the single day that you start um, changing one word into this configuration or adding one plugin, then it gets increasingly um, more difficult to actually uh, upgrade your whole tooling to adapt to the newer configuration. You never know if you actually are making use of the latest feature you're upgrading to in your dependencies. So this is really a struggle. And sometimes the only way out was to completely, you know, delete the configuration of the projects and, and replace the code into a, a newly created project. So very cumbersome. And so with a tool like Vue CLI, you don't have this aspect. You're always managing plugins, which means the whole configuration that you make is portable from one upgrade to the other. And so that's really the, the big advantage here. So let's go to the state management. So with Nick, we've seen a bit of, of state management with React and uh, React also has the, this uh, uh, more complicated approach with, uh, with with Flux and so on that has a history. Uh, the view tooling is a bit in, the, in between, so it doesn't maintain an history of all the changes, um, but it offers two possibilities. So you see at the bottom, you have the state, right? Which um, direct rendering, so what, that's what we've seen before. It's the same in view. But then you have mutation in action. And so why is that? The mutation will actually be direct change. So let's say you have a calculator and you want to compute two times 10, right? And then your displayed result will be updated when you press enter, it will be just computed and updated to 20. There is nothing to wait for, right? So this will be a mutation. But if you have like a blog and you want to go to the next page of, of posts, then you would, you would be calling an action and say, action, when you return me a value, then provoke a mutation to change the state. And when the change will be, the state will be changed, then the component will update. And so that, that allows to handle asynchronous events. And so that's, that's a pretty clean, clean way of managing all the, the state changes. Then there is view router. So what is actually a router? That's a, a pretty interesting question. In a traditional website, you know, you go to a page and uh, to a domain, for example, and it will take, for example, index.html or index.php or whatever. It will take the actual page and this page will be a file in the corresponding directory. So if you go to the help HTML, you go to another file, which is help HTML. But so with those JavaScript framework, um, they are frequently associated with single page application. Right. Um, you can also, of course, with Vue, do multiple page websites, right? As I shown before, you can include uh, Vue as a script, um, and then you have different page and you still have a traditional website. But you can also do a single page application. What does that mean? It means when you go to the page, you actually go to index.js. Um, and then when you get to a sub page, for example, to the setting page, then the URL looks like this. It started with a hash. So there are also ways to mask this with uh, special settings on the web server, but I'm showing you the basic way to simplify a bit. So the basic way, it used this hash and then something that looks like a URL, except what's behind is not really a URL, it's a traditional anchor. So you know when you use a hyperlink on web page, um, Usually you use a hyperlink to go to another page, but you can also use hyperlinks to navigate inside a page through anchors. You know, and um, I think many of you are probably in my case, it's like, oh, it's true, we can actually do this. I've not used that in like 10 years. Um, and so 
this functionality has been basically reused by by the crowd when uh, asynchronous JavaScript came on Ajax in the mid 2000s. And so what it allows that is to actually save the state of the page in the URL without actually going out of the page. And so that means you can record all kinds of changes um, into the URL and the application will understand what to do out of this, but you will stay on the same page, which is very interesting because then that means if you're not moving to a new page, right, your performance um, can get um, a positive aspect from this because maybe from the settings, you'll just download, you know, a bit of markup and a bit of uh, handler, but you will not be refreshing the whole page, the whole styling and so on. So sometimes you have a gain to do from that. Of course, the downside is that on the initial load, you have way more. So this is always something that's uh, to, be, to be taken with care. But so then this router helps actually the, the view application to actually make sense of those changes and to say, look, this part of the app, for example, the central you know, uh, place in, in the app, usually you will take most of the screen with that. This will be controlled by the router, which means when the router notice that there is a change in the URL, that anything uh, behind the hash is changed, then it will show another part on the screen. And so this is basically what it does. And this is what you can do with, with uh, view router. And it brings all kinds of um, sort of, uh, of sugar on top. For example, you can decide to um, uh, download the code on demand that's, um, that's, that's uh, dedicated to those, um, you know, sub part of the, the app. You can also make visual transitions for, for example, having the pages slide in instead of having, you know, just an abrupt refresh. The next thing that you can do with you is also side rendering and also referral. This is common to multiple frameworks by now. Uh, this has been introduced mainly to be better at SEO. So to provide better SEO support and also a better, uh, faster time to display the first data. So as I showed before, in, in one of those JavaScript framework, very often you download first the index.js. So you download JavaScript, it will get the data, it will get the remaining dependency and then display. With server-side rendering, what we, what we do is basically taking advantage of very often uh, JavaScript backend like Node.js. Uh, this has been a real uh, a boost to this, uh, to this kind of practice because we can reuse basically almost the same code, right? And so the server will already take the, 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 the logic and render some first markup so that the first display of data will be much faster. Um, what will be a bit slower though is the first interaction because usually you will have to download the same JavaScript than before um, plus the additional markup that you have at the start. So it will be slightly, slightly slower. Um, but you know, this is always uh, to be taken with a grain of salt because you can optimize this. You have multiple tools that you can use for server-side rendering with you. Max, um, Quasar, Gridsome has some tooling that uh, enables server-side rendering. And all of those tools are very interesting. I advise you to have a look at it if you, if you want to, to work with you. But you can also do pre-render inside view. So really on your own, you can, you can create your own code for pre-rendering specific part of your app. So for example, if you really have a home page that you want to speed up, gets a lot of traffic, for example, you can also do that without moving your complete tooling. So a bit of history, Vue was created um, around 2014 and it came after React and way after Angular. Um, and since it has had also a few uh, refactoring, so there have been a few changes they are not too frequent, but happen now and then. And now we are again in such a, a change for, between view two and view three, um, where uh, many new things that are coming. And most of the example I gave are actually basing on, on view two, because it's the most widespread for now. And also because the ecosystem is not completely migrated to view three. So, so far view three is pretty stable uh, as for the core is concerned. And now the library are, are, are moving and port to view three. So this is what's happening right now. Um, view is an interesting project because it's been created by Evan Yu, uh, who was working at Google at the time, um, highly inspired from uh, web components and in Angular. And so the fact that this has been so strongly driven by Evan Yu 
helped Zoo to be um, a very coherent uh, kind of library in its core. Also, it has from the start on attracted a certain type of developer. I would say this is usually people who are more interested in CSS and markup, uh, are a bit more naturally um, interested into Vue because it put markup at the top. Um, but afterwards, after a couple of years, it started diversifying the, the governance. And so there is now a core team that takes care of, of Vue and it's not, it's not like it's completely dependent on even you, right? Um, so there, there is a core team that takes all the decision and um, it's, it's worked tightly also with the ecosystem. It's community driven, it's really a, a pure open source project. So to say it's not owned by a company. So I think this is a really cool thing. Uh, of you. So, right, uh, the question is now what framework should I choose, right? I think if you come to this discussion, you're probably interested in this question. My opinion is pretty clear here, there is no better one. Uh, you have to choose the one that's the best for you. So um, you should look at licensing, at how is it fitting your own programming style, what's the ecosystem, what's the tooling, what are the skills in your team currently and what's the context of the organization? Um, how do you think the, the tooling is future ready and how's the support? So all those questions plays a role, right? If you want to learn more and um, you know sell view to your team and your boss, then uh, I highly advise you to look at the state of your report because uh, it provides lots of uh, industry reports of interview of uh, you know, teams that actually implemented Vue in, in production for their for their product. So this is a great way to see what works, what doesn't, what you should be uh, careful of. And finally, let's get started. So, you know, go to Vue.js.org and, and try. So thank you. Any questions? Stefan, we have one question in the chat from Alexander L. He's asking, how good is the TypeScript support for Vue? with view can you guarantee type and null safety when passing props or handling events like in react are missing required props a report are reported by the compiler so okay i cannot answer that fully but the, the typescript support is definitely good like i know people who who used to work exclusively with type, typescript and view i have not tried it much myself i've played a bit with that um, so I think this will be pretty similar to React. I would expect from that from from that from that point of view. Um, also, if you're coming from from the React space and you're wondering about Vue, so I spoke a lot about the whole um, single file component and the markup uh, top, but you can also write an application by using the render method. So if you're more, you know, if you prefer, write your components with classes and with render. You can do that as well with you if this is possible. Okay, Alexander, if that's fine for you, then then uh, that's fine. Otherwise, just keep asking the question in the chat. And then I just have a personal question. I, I come from React, so I don't know Vue or Angular. Is it also possible to lazy load parts of the application like you can do with React, or is that yeah, just a so React feature? Uh, no, no, it's it's possible because that's actually not a React feature. That's a, a Webpack feature. Okay. So, and and the way you would do, uh, if I remember well, um, you you can place an asynchronous call basically on, uh, uh, sorry, a conditional call on on Webpack, uh, and if you call Webpack in a special manner, then uh, you will be able to to load um, a part of of the of the app asynchronously. Because the thing is, when you want to call it asynchronously, that means that this part of the app also and all this dependency need to be in a separate bundle of its own that's consistent in itself. Um, the way I've did it so far in my view application is that I place those calls usually under the, the router. So the router, um, it's it's very easy with the, the view router actually in the, when you describe your routes, um, if I remember well, in a, in some uh, a, a JSON structure, then um, you can tell that this part of the app should be uh, uh, loaded asynchronously, so on demand. Basically, it's, this means when you will reach this route, you will actually on demand 
uh, as for the bundles that are associated with it. Okay, thank you. So I don't see any other questions in the chat so far. Maybe something else will pop up. Otherwise, thank you so much, Stefan, for your insights to Vue.js. And then I think we'll hand it over to our last speaker, Noe, to make you the presenter. If I find here the... Yes, I just need to see my presentation. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Um, hello, everyone. I will just drop the video for uh, to have a good connection. Um, yeah, I will skip that. We just go to philosophy. Um, Angular is, in my opinion, built around the concept of choose reasonable defaults and let developers focus on the work. Um, compared to Vue and React, which we saw before, you it's more a framework than just a library. It gives clear structures about how to organize your your components, your project, um, both in kind of where to put code and styling, but also in folder structures. Um, as also already said, um, Angular is the oldest of all these three um, web frameworks. Um, but when we talk about Angular, we typically call the uh, talk these days about Angular 2 and not anymore about Angular JS. So here's a little bit of history. Angular 2 was finally released in 2016 with TypeScript um, support, React, RxJS, and a provider-based dependency injection style. Um, the ne next big update was Angular 5 in 2017 with PVA support and uh, material design. Next in 2019, we got with Angular 8 differential loading, web workers and the uh, language server preview. In 2020, we got the new Ivy compiler and um, the latest update, Angular 11 added the experimental templates language server. I will talk about them um, some of these topics in the um, later slides. Um, essentials of Angular are definitely that it splits components into it into a markup file, into a style file, and in a component file. While you could put this everything together in one file, it's typically split into these three distinct files. Um, in the HTML markup templates, you have things like structural directives, which we will see later, the case study, as well as property and event bindings. Um, you have modules, uh, so you organize your application around modules, which allow you to do routing and lazy loading. Um, you have a CLL, CLI as well, and semantics. Semantics are a way to, um, to easily add new components, services, and so on. Um, another big thing in Angular is the observable pattern, which um, which we also will see later, as well as services and dependency injection. Um, these are some frameworks and add-ons. Um, RxJS is um, is used for the observable pattern and is deep integrated into Angular and the HTTP client and the router are both built around RxJS. Then we have the Angular Flex layout, which provide, which is a third party add-on, which provides uh, Angular template directives for um, using Flexbox and CSS script. Then we have Angular Material, which is an parallel development in Angular project and gives you a lot of the material components. The material design is a design guideline from Google. Um, then you have NGRX, which I don't think is used that much, but I still wanted to uh, mention it since there are probably some people using React here and therefore are um, no Redux. NGRX is kind of Redux plus um, the RxJS framework I mentioned. Nest.js is a Node.js server framework which um, is built around the concept um, of modules and components and controllers we, we have in Angular. 
and finally native script while working with Vue and React as well is also um, um, you could use Angular with that as well and it's a mobile cross-platform UI framework. Um, community, just these two pictures. I, I myself never really engaged so far with the Angular community, therefore I can't say if they're friendly or not, but I guess they are. Um, it's used by quite a lot of people and it has a, also quite a lot of contributors. Um, it has a update cycle which with a major release of every six months, followed by one to three minor releases. And as already said, Angular Material fo follows the same cycle. Um, there on the right, you see an image where um, for the major releases, Angular provides you with an update um, instructions, which um, I already used twice in my career and they, they work really good. So that's it's an interesting one. Um, on the performance side, you have quite a bit um, of stuff to tweak the performance out of your Angular applications. First of all, we have the new Ivy compiler, which um, which which reduces the bundle size of um, an Angular application a lot by doing quite sophisticated optimizations. Next, you have differential loading, which um, allows you to serve smaller bundles to more, um, more modern browsers. Web workers allow you to, to run different part of your application in a own thread in the browser. Tree shaking, while not being included by default right now, will soon be included and allow you, again, smaller bundle size. Um, change detection strategy is something where, again, you Angular gives you the a good default, but if you but if you want to um, max out the performance of your application, you can change that globally, which again gives you some more um, performance. You have a good integration for server side rendering as well, and also lazy loading is per default integrated in the Angular routing package. Um, popular websites using Angular include a lot of Google websites, um, Nest.js, the current Xbox website of Microsoft, and Udacity. That's what they look like. Here we see a lot of this Angular material being used. Um, yeah. So, and now I will switch and give you some um, some live demo about these four topics. The idea is to show you how to use reactive forms in Angular. Next, um, the Angular material will have a little showcase, followed by Angular Flex. And finally, I will use a short visualization, a small visualization to show you the double binding. So, okay. Um, here on the left is my EDA, on the right side is my, is my web browser. You see here um, the typical structure of an Angular project just generated by the CLI. We have here the component, here's the markup file, and finally the CSS. Um, what we have here is we build a form group which is just really what we will use for our form, which has um, different controls in it. And we can give these controls uh, validators. So we say, for example, the name is required. Um, an email has to be an email and is required as well. The password should have a length of at least 10 is required as well. And the confirmed password is obviously also at least 10 characters length. Um, then we add a validator, which, which will check that the password and the confirmed password are actually the same. Um, this is really simple. Just get these two fields out of the form group and compare their value. So in the markup, we add the form group to our form 
And with this form control name directive, we can say that this input field is linked to this control in our component. And on the back, on and we see we can access the form group status. So when we start entering here our our content, we see that the status will actually be updated in real time. Oh, can we? Oh, passwords don't match. So. And that without me doing anything. So this connection between um, these two two value binding is just is working right out the box um, compared to React where you wired up everything on your own. I wouldn't say necessarily that it's better than the other thing. It's just something um, you could easily do in Angular. Um, if I remove, for example, here, we will see the form status gets updated automatically, depending on our input. Next, we go to um, the material design. We'll see it, I don't even know. <laughs> it updates quite a lot. Um, the material design gives us a new new um, components, pre-built components, which allow us to build um, designs like this with having having this label automatically moving up there, um, again, showing us the state of our different components. And here we see everything works as well. Um, what we see here currently, all our CSS, which isn't that much, but it's um, in this CSS file. What we will do next when we switch to um, the Angular Flex, we will move all of this into our markup file, and we can build um, and we can add some uh, responsive um, template directive. So by saying a fixed layout less than medium, we add um, a media query in the back. So if we increase the screen size, our form will react to this, which allows you to really easily build um, responsive websites compared to writing all these media queries by hand. I, I really enjoy this style of just, can use, of just using less than medium and greater than small, for example, makes it really easy to work with um, Angular with Flexbox. The last thing I wanted to show you is um, the small visualization where we have that double value binding. What we have here is a slider, again, coming from material, Angular material, um, with this, little um, hash slider, we make, we have a, a, a HTML directive, which we can access from a different component, just by writing slider.value. And this way, these two values are coupled. What we could do as well is, we could um, use a value change function, which the math slider provides to access every time the value changes. We see this here in the console. Yep. Down there, if we play with that, we get a console lock from here. And this again, and with this, I can show you something really cool coming with Ivy, which I already mentioned is the new template language server. Um, if for example, I, you see here, the value change um, property is connected to the on change and it's passing an event. Now, if I'm changing in the app component, this function 
to having no input. Ivy is able to, uh, Angular is able to verify that now my HTML, my markup file isn't um, complying to my component file and it refuses to work. And then it works again if I change this, which is, which when I began working with Angular, I felt like, nice, you have all this type TypeScript support, but still the connection between the markup and the, and the component isn't really working. And now with Angular 11, they changed that. And I, I personally think that's, that's a really cool feature to have, to having these type checks between the markup and the component. Yes. Um, yeah, that was actually everything I wanted to show you for Angular. Are there questions from your side? So there is one question from Mich. Is the FX layout solved with JavaScript or just a collection of CSS helpers? Um, I'm actually not sure how it's working in the background, I have to say. Otherwise, I didn't see any other questions, but Mich is typing. Okay. Yeah, I will stop the recording now in case someone wants to speak. So the thank you again, Noe, also for your part. The recording is stopped now.